All right, you guys, today we're going to finish up this unit uh, with feeding standards, uh, food preparation, and storage. So we'll start with the feeding standards. What are they? Where do we find them? Uh, what's included in them? Uh, and then we'll continue talking about kind of what kind of factors affect uh, nutrient requirements of the animal. Uh, we've touched base a little bit about this uh, with growth and production. Um, but how do you assess uh, an animal's nutritional status? So we'll talk a little bit about that, um, as well as finishing up our talk kind of in general about uh, feed preparation and processing, uh, kind of the different um, ways you can process feed, as well as storage. So what is the appropriate uh, way to store feed, as well as sanitation and uh, APHIS. So the definition of feeding standards, essentially it's a quantitative description, meaning how much of these nutrients, either one or more of the nutrients, is actually needed by the animal. And these are published by various committees of the National Research Council, which is kind of the overarching um, National Academy of Science. So it's within uh, the National Academy of Science and uh, the NRC uh, publishes these books um, and they update them every few years for these feeding standards. And you can find them, you know, for, for most animals out there, obviously, our exotic friends uh, can be a little bit different, but definitely for our domestic and production animals. So when we're talking about feeding standards, we have some terminology that is used and we've seen a lot of these before. So we just kind of, we've already talked about them, but we're putting it all together uh, with how do you actually read these feeding standards. So they're gonna give you quantity, right? We said it's a quantitative uh, description of these uh, nutrients. So kind of our options are, um, they'll give you in it a per day quantity, which are, is usually for an exact um, amount um, per day that you should feed. Um, or it could be as a percentage of the diet. And this is usually when you're feeding um, ad libitum, so uh, free feed. So that usually is in a percentage. And the amounts can be in weights, you know, grams, milligrams, um, kilograms, uh, but they can also be in percents. Um, we talked about um, some of our vitamins and minerals being in uh, PPMs or parts per million. The other thing that's also common is international units, especially for some uh, vitamins. So as you can see down here um, in our little table, you see the vitamins are definitely in um, international units. So. So for some other uh, terminology we use in feeding standards for protein is very specific. Um, we use digestible protein uh, for most animals, but then for ruminants, they like to use crude protein or metabolizable protein, which is very similar. Um, so these are the different ways we can talk about protein. Some uh, suggest um, the biological value of it, but some don't. So again, we kind of are going back to that protein lecture. As well as especially for uh, ruminants, we talk about non-protein nitrogen in the diet as well. And this is just a little table about the different digestibility percentages of some of these uh, different forages. So we talked about the maturity of plants and essentially as the uh, maturity of the plant increases, the digestibility decreases, okay? So some more terminology we use is for energy. So if we go back to our energy uh, lecture, some of these terms might we might remember and we'll go through them a little bit. But um, for a lot of our domestic species, they use metabolizable energy. So ME, uh, like our dogs and our cats. Uh, for horses and rabbits, they tend to use digestible energy. 
Uh, and then for some of our productive animals, production animals, um, cows, sheep, swine, uh, we use total digestible nutrient. And so digestible energy and total digestible nutrient are very similar, if we remember kind of back to our energy lecture. But what are these, what are they again? Let's kind of look at our, so I included our table down here to help us remember. So remember our gross energy is kind of the max amount of energy that that food um, contains. So digestible energy essentially is that gross energy minus the loss in the, fe in the feces. So you're gonna lose the fecal energy. So that's digestible energy. So we use that a lot in the horses. And then total digestible nutrient is very similar to that. And then metabolizable energy is even more specific than that because we have to account for then urine loss of energy as well. Okay, so that is how we get to that meta metabolizable energy. Now, when you talk about nutrients and when you're, um, you know, calculating the nutrient needs for an animal, you're usually talking about them in relation to the amount of energy they provide for the animal. And this is very common in non-ruminant species. It's a little bit different in our ruminant species, but um, we do use energy as a big marker uh, for our nutrients. So there are multiple types of studies that are done um, to make these feeding standards. So we'll talk about some of them. So one of them is the calorimetric studies. And essentially, it's a way to um, find out how many calories are actually in the feed. So we talked about this a little bit in our energy lecture as well. You know, what is the overall max amount of calories um, in a food? Uh, so this is, you know, they, they, they quantify the heat release uh, from the breakdown of that uh, food stuff, so, or that nutrient. So then they see what that max or gross energy uh, is. But of course, this doesn't quite reflect um, the energy utilized by the animal. So other two methods that they use, um, they're very similar. Uh, one is the factorial method. And essentially they back calculate um, what the utilization of the animal must have been if they look at the excreted amounts in the feces and the urine. Um, and this is very similar uh, to a balance study. Essentially, they, they look at the amount of the diet going in and the amount uh, in the feces and urine coming out. So kind of a balance um, study there. So very similar. The factorial method just kind of back calculates the utilization um, from the feces and the urine. And then of course they also do feeding trials. So one of the organizations um, that does these feeding trials is AFCO. And we'll talk a little bit more about AFCO, um, the pros and cons of AFCO. But of course other companies, uh, even the pet food companies themselves uh, can do these feeding trials. Okay, so essentially you feed the diet to an animal and see, you know, the pros and cons. Does it lose weight, gain weight? Um, does it have any deficiencies over a period of time? And, you know, you do uh, physical examinations and different um, blood work and tests that you can run during the feeding trial to make sure everything is going okay. So those uh, studies we talked about are not very good for vitamin levels. They're better for kind of the overall energy. Um, so some, some of these studies that they actually do for vitamin levels, uh, you look more at the tissues, at the blood levels. So they take samples, you know, of the blood to see what those ranges are. But they can also look at just signs and symptoms of deficiency. So if the animal is free of any sort of uh, signs or symptoms, they assume that the animal is not uh, at least clinically deficient. Um, another way is to see if the animal, especially in production, uh, can produce at max levels. Are they able to actually, you know, produce and um, 
give you what you need at, uh, at the maximum levels on that diet. And just on this table, of course, you don't need to memorize anything or look at anything, but this is just showing you uh, the vitamins that they're looking at, what the normal range is, and then the different levels they can be or what's considered high and low uh, in the blood. So if they look at the levels in the blood. So the take home message for feeding standards is there a really good estimate and the key word here is estimate of the nutrient requirements, but it's not, definitely not a final answer, right? You, it's not the gold standard. It's going to be a very good estimate and then we are just going to have to maybe tweak it here and there for each individual need. And it's not a fixed uh, quantity, right? So this doesn't necessarily mean that each animal, each dairy cow in that book is going to get X, Y, and Z. So just you have to take into account, you know, the age of the animal, the source of the nutrient, especially, and then all these other dietary and environmental factors. So we'll talk a little bit about these different factors that can uh, change the nutrient requirements. Another thing you have to take into account when you're talking about feeding standards is that it's really based on a population of animals. So it's not based on individuals. So when you look at a population, there's going to be a bell curve, right? So this is just a normal bell curve um, over here on the right, just showing you that most people or most animals are going to fall within that um, mid range for the bell curve. And that is where that feeding standard is based. It's based upon the average animal, right? So if you're talking about a herd, well, the majority of them are going to fall within that curve, right? They're going to be just fine. They're going to be maintained. They're not going to gain weight or lose weight. But some of them you will overfeed, right? So some people are going to get fat or some animals are going to get fat because they're just different. And then some are going to be underfed where they need more food. So you're going to get these outliers on the bell curve if you feed um, the feeding standard to a herd. So let's talk a little bit about AFCO because um, many of you have probably seen AFCO statements on different feeds and essentially they are kind of a go-to organization for understanding animal feed. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about what they do and don't do. Um, essentially, it stands for the Association of American Feed Control Officials, um, but they're not part of uh, the FDA. So essentially, they do not approve or certify any pet food or product. The FDA regulates pet food, and the FDA is a member of AFCO. So AFCO is just this large organization of a bunch of different um, regulatory bodies such as the FDA. And so if you follow the FDA rules, you know, they're, it's very similar to human food, right? So they demand that pet food be pure and wholesome, right? Safe to eat, produced under sanitary conditions, contain no harmful substances, and be truthfully labeled. Well, some of these things may not hold true, uh, for a lot of feeds. And so uh, let's look at that a little bit. Okay, so I just have one of their AFCO statements over here that you can find on a lot of feeds. This one is specifically for growing animals. So they have a couple of different statements that they can put on these pet foods, just depending on what kind of testing that has been done on the feed. So AFCO itself does not necessarily ensure that, you know, a food is safe or meets the requirements or is even adequate as a diet, but it does rely on scientific knowledge. And essentially they provide the guidelines for um, what should be in pet food. 
And if you follow the guidelines, then you're going to minimize the risk of malnutri malnutrition. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to eliminate it. So what do they do? Well, they uh, are part of the pet food label. So they help regulate the components in the pet food. So they have a list of things that should be um, labeled and some things aren't required to be labeled. Uh, and we'll see a couple of examples here. Um, they do have these statements. So they um, do provide this nutritional adequacy designation, which means that it should be, you know, a balanced and complete uh, nutrition for these different animals. And that's uh, regarding these statements. Um, and AFCO does do feeding trials, but their feeding trials um, are not necessarily rigorous. So they feed um, the diet to, I think, six animals have to complete the feeding trial for it to be considered a feeding trial. They have to be fed it for six months, I believe, which is not very long. Um, and they have to undergo a couple different tests and physical exams uh, during that time period. So is it considered a rigorous feeding trial? Probably not. Um, and you can find um, other rigorous testing methods out there and you know a lot of people ask should diets undergo these uh, better ways of testing um, so if you're interested and want to learn more about um, AFCO pet food labeling kind of the pros and cons um, I have a website here that you can uh, look at um, and you can click on the link if you're in the PowerPoint um, so it just kind of goes over what um, AFCO actually does and what these different labels and statements mean. So just, just for an example, you know, for AFCO uh, requirements on how to name pet foods. So this is kind of, you know, eye opening is when, you know, something says this is an ingredient, it has to have 95% of the ingredient named. So who knows what that extra 5% is. If it's anything else, like a formula, dinner, entree, recipe, it only has to have 25%, which is kind of scary. And even scarier is the width and the flavors. So, you know, 3%, that's it. If it says with chicken or with seafood and flavoring is less than that, but it uh, must disclose the source of the flavor. Okay. so. Just kind of some ideas on uh, what AFCO does. So there are many variables that can alter nutrient needs and utilization. So how much do they need and how much do they actually use uh, once they eat it? So that's the difference between, you know, what they may need and what the gold standard is, but what is their body actually using. So these are the variables that can definitely uh, alter nutrient need. Um, weather, right? We talked about this already a little bit with the hot versus cold, you know, and how much animals actually eat during those times. Uh, any sort of stress, right? Whether that's environmental um, or even by disease, parasitism, those are things that cause stress. Um, especially GI parasitism is going to really affect the utilization um, and how much they're um, utilizing and absorbing those nutrients. Uh, injury or surgery, right? If they're recovering from something, uh, they may need uh, more. Uh, the need might increase. And so there's so many variables that it's too difficult to really include all these different variables quantitatively. So to actually say, okay, when it has this disease or this parasite, you need to do this. So they're often just not included. Um, 
So that's where, you know, the vet or whoever makes those decisions is going to, um, it's up to their discretion because it's not necessarily in these feeding standards. Now, when you talk about production animals, there are very well-known adjustments for production animals. So when, when and how much do you increase uh, the nutrients at what time in their production. So that is, and we're not gonna go through that. Um, you can find it in the book if you are interested in the different um, production animals and what the needs are and how they vary. Our focus is more on maintenance levels. Uh, so our domestic species, our captive species, where you really don't want them to either gain or lose any sort of body energy, body mass, you know, you want to keep them at their ideal weight, right? Their maintenance weight. And this is a really good benchmark. This is kind of what you're aiming for. And the maintenance levels are always going to be lower than the productive levels or work, right? So they're always going to be lower, um, but it's a good starting spot, right? And then you can always adjust from there. So what are the nutrient requirements? What are these factors? We've talked about some of the nutrient requirements for animals um, in our other lectures, but what is actually affecting those nutrient requirements? And we've talked a little bit about this. So genetics are obviously going to affect it, right? These animals have different genes and that can affect um, their individuality, right? So you can have nutritional individuality as well. Some animal may be a pig, right? And eat a lot of food just because they want to, or maybe they're picky eaters, right? So everybody is a little bit individual. Not everybody is the same. Breed and species, right? So even within a species, there can be breed differences. So how their metabolism functions, it can be different, right? Environmental factors, and we talked a bit about environmental factors. So um, how, how can they get to their food, uh, the heat, the stress, the cold, um, all these different environmental factors can definitely affect them. Uh, feed consumption. So last lecture, we talked all about what can affect feed consumption, right? So palatability of the feed, you know, do they want to eat it? Um, hunger versus appetite. Uh, so you can, of course, give them their required amounts, but whether they eat it or not is a different question, right? So feed consumption uh, definitely can have an effect. So let's talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, nutrition and disease. We've been talking about things that can affect uh, the nutrient requirements, and we know that disease uh, is one of them. Um, so how does nutrition affect the immune system and vice versa? Um, more importantly, how does the immune system affect uh, the nutritional requirements? So any sort of immunological stress, right? Disease, injury, um, even um, environmental stresses that can affect the immune system are going to alter the nutritional requirements. But how is the big question. So if you can identify that change in requirements, say it needs more of um, this type of energy or whatever that may be, then you can use that uh, requirement to your advantage to actually promote um, the optimum response of the immune system. So you can actually boost the immune system if you can figure out um, what that nutrient requirement is. So this little picture just kind of shows, you know, different types of, you know, external stresses, internal stresses, and how they can affect each other. You know, we affect the GI system. Um, if we have some sort of internal uh, stress, uh, you can have um, external stresses as well that then affect the GI tract. So it's all interrelated.
So another thing with uh, nutrition and disease and um, something that you may not think, but uh, interestingly enough, well-fed animals uh, tend to be more susceptible to uh, viruses, uh, which is interesting. Um, but they can be more resistant to bacterial or parasitic infections. So they're a little more susceptible to viruses, but more resistant to bacteria and parasites, which is quite interesting. And as we can um, expect, you know, we've talked about vitamin deficiencies before, but very specifically vitamin A deficiency um, can definitely cause an animal to be more susceptible to infectious diseases. But, you know, we've talked quite a bit about vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And when they are deficient, you know, a lot of these vitamins and minerals are required for a functioning immune system. So if you're deficient in, in that coenzyme for whatever that may be in a pathway of the immune system, then you're going to be more susceptible to um, any sort of infectious disease. So that makes sense. So how do we actually assess the nutritional status of an animal? How do you say, you know, this one is good, this one is deficient? What are some of the things that we can look for and that we can test for? So you want to start out with a nutritional history, right? So um, what has the animal been eating? How has it responded to that diet? Um, what are the pros and cons to that diet? Obviously, this is a lot harder for free range animals. So things, you know, you don't know what exactly they're eating. But obviously with our uh, domestic and captive animals, that's a lot easier. Uh, you have to know what the animal productivity level is, right? So if it's a production animal or if it's a growing animal, you know that um, the nutritional uh, need is going to be greater, right? Pregnant animals, lactating animals, um, that, that requirement is going to be increased. So two more things we can do to help assess the nutritional status. Um, uh, one would be physical examinations, and that can be even um, from far away. You know, you don't necessarily have to be hands-on, uh, like this picture in the left. And obviously, with a lot of our um, exotic species, hands-on may not be um, an option. So what are some of the things you can do from far away? Well, you can assess their quality of coat, fur coat, their hair, you know, a lot of the deficiencies we talked about can affect um, their, their coat or maybe their um, feathering, right? So different things like that you can definitely assess from far away. You can watch them walk, you know, assess their gait for any sort of neurological abnormalities. Watching them laying down and getting up is a great uh, test for um, a neurological status as well as their just energy level, right? If they're laying down too often, if they can't get up, things like that, um, you can definitely assess from far away. And then the nitty gritty, right? You can definitely test for a lot of these things uh, in different uh, tissues. So the easiest one is probably, you know, urine or feces and then blood and hair, right? So those guys are fairly easy to get samples of. And then you can dig a little deeper. You could get um, bone samples, liver or kidney biopsies, and then you can perform any array of biochemical analysis on uh, these tissue samples. So let's look a little bit more into these tissue samples and what they may tell us. So when we talk about blood, uh, blood can be good for some of the minerals, but not all of them. So we can find uh, copper, iron, and iodine fairly well in the blood by uh, looking at different things. Like for iron, you can look at the hemoglobin status. Uh, for iodine, you can look at thyroid hormone levels. So then you can deduce by those levels um, 
in the blood if you are deficient or not. Uh, but most of the other minerals are really hard to tell um, unless you are severely deficient, you know, especially for like calcium per se. It's so tightly regulated that you're not going to see the deficiency in the blood until it's quite severe because your body has a way to um, uh, counteract that the low levels of calcium in the blood. So you're not going to see it unless it's severe. Hair is really only good to look at the history of the um, nutritional status. It only reveals any sort of past events, uh, past levels, but not current. Uh, so hair is a good, maybe a good uh, historical measurement, but definitely not a good um, current measurement. Bone is great for calcium and phosphorus, um, but obviously it's hard to get samples. So a different test you may be able to do would be bone density test to, set, to say um, hopefully what are, what's the mineral status uh, in the bone tissue. And we can take liver and kidney biopsies. Uh, these are the organs where we store a lot of vitamins and minerals. So you can uh, take those levels uh, in the biopsy and make sure they're okay. Or even, especially if we're talking about iron, and uh, you may see an over, um, over storage of that mineral as well. Or, or vitamin, right? We have some vitamin toxicities with some of our, uh, especially our fat soluble vitamins. Urine, right? So this is a great diagnostic tool. Uh, you can see things that are gonna be excreted into the urine that may or may not uh, necessarily, uh, that should may or may not necessarily be there, right? So you shouldn't really find ketones uh, glucose, things like that, you really shouldn't see high levels of certain things. Um, minerals and vitamins, nitrogen, so you can kind of get a good idea of the metabolic status of the animal by looking at the urine and doing a urinalysis. And it's a fairly easy test as well. So now that we've looked at a bit of the feeding standards, right, how do we know um, what we should feed the animal and what those uh, nutrient requirements are and what can change those nutrient requirements, let's talk about how we uh, prepare the feed. How, how are these different feed stuffs prepared? How are diets prepared? Especially these kind of complete feeds, pelleted feeds, um, these how do we um, prepare these uh, grains for consumption because you know feed cost is really high especially in animal production it's about 50 to 80 percent of animal production cost so it's a huge cost so essentially you really want to make sure that what you're uh, feeding the animal they're going to eat and with as little amount of waste as possible um, to make sure they're not wasting any of the food that you give them and you want to make sure that uh, the efficiency is also high, meaning uh, what they do eat that their body is actually using. So making sure that the feed is highly digestible and that uh, they can actually get the energy uh, requirements from the feed. So when we talk about feed preparation, we're a lot of the times talking about feed processing. So feed processing um, can definitely involve a lot of these different alterations of the feed. So we can alter it physically, we can alter it chemically, um, you can change the heat status, so thermal energy, um, you can um, change it uh, by adding different bacteria to it, so you can alter it bacterially. So all of these alterations changes a couple different things about the feed. So you can alter the form, right? You can make it into a pellet. Uh, so you can change the size of that pellet. Um, you can even grind it down to powder or meal. Um, you can add preservatives um, so it'll last longer. 
Uh, you can isolate different parts of the feed, uh, meaning, you know, if you want, uh, you know, higher protein or fat, you can change the different nutrient composition of the feed. Um, you can make it more palatable, right? You can add flavoring. Um, you can make it more digestible. You know, we talked about the maturity of the different grasses um, and the, you know, cellulose levels of some of these uh, different forages and roughages. So you can change a lot of these different components to try to make it, you know, more of an efficient feed, meaning that the animal is going to get, you know, more out of the feed. So let's talk a bit about grain processing first. So there's a couple different ways you can process the grain. You can process it, you know, dry methods versus wet methods. There's higher moisture grains. Um, you can do hot processing and cold processing. So we'll talk a little bit about these different um, processing methods. So first let's talk about cold processing. So this is fairly common um, when you're grinding uh, the grains, right? So they use a lot of mills um, to grind the seeds um, of these different grasses, um, so these cereal grains, so that's very common. And then you can um, reconstitute them, meaning you can add moisture to increase uh, the moisture content of the food, of these dry, of these grains. But um, the problem is, is um, that you can have a problem with uh, preservation. So they definitely don't last as long if you uh, reconstitute them. So a lot of times they're stored, you know, as a dry content and then you can reconstitute them later when you feed them. So these high moisture grains, uh, such as corn, can have to be stored properly, right? So they have to be ground or rolled first. Um, and then a lot of the times they add an acid preservation because we said we have problem with storage if the moisture content is too high. So now let's talk about hot processing. So you can um, do some steam processing. So you can do steam rolled or flaked grain. So it's another way to process grain. Um, and then there's two different types of hot processing that are really common um, ways to uh, alter food and make them much more uh, palatable and digestible. So one is a pelleted feed. So you mix the food together, so you do the, the, the different food components, you heat it up, and then you compress it into a mold, into a pellet. And essentially what happens is if we look at our little picture here, we've got the feed that are little dots then you have these rollers that are going to compress and push the food out these little holes and then we're creating these pellets and you can create different sized pellets um, obviously different composition of pellets um, but the the big advantage is most animals do prefer pelleted feed and the, the another big advantage of pelleted feed is the animal can't pick out the different nutrients. So it can't decide, ooh, that tastes better. I'm going to eat more of that. Like if you were to just give them a forage such as alfalfa, they could pick out the leaves and leave the stem or any of those cereal grains. You know, they'll pick out the oats um, and the seeds and then just leave the stems. So this is a way to decrease that sorting by the animal um, and that preference. So they just eat the whole pellet and then you know that they're getting all the nutrients in that pelleted feed. Another way of hot processing is extruded feed. And it's very similar to pelleted feed, but it's a little bit different um, in the way that uh, it's produced um, and what it looks like. So this is really common in pet food. And again, it's still a hot uh, processing um, method, but essentially in our little picture here, uh, we've got an extruder. So you, you, know, you put the feed into the bin, 
mixes around and then essentially you heat it up as well so it's a hot processing and then this screw this large screw pushes all the feed through a nozzle and then we have a mold so you can create different sized uh, pellets as well and you know they look like pellets but it's a little different process um, than the pelleting and so you can uh, you get these little uh, nuggets um, out of it so very common in you know your pet food the dog food um, fish food um, so you see these little um, these little nuggets Another common thing in feed processing or feed preparation is spraying the feed. Uh, so once you, you know, make those pellets or the extruded processing, uh, you can spray that feed with different substances like molasses for, you know, energy, that's sugar, uh, fat, um, and other liquids. But the big um, benefits of spraying the feed is one you're going to decrease the dust levels and we said that dust definitely decreases palatability uh, you can increase the energy right so you're adding you know the carbohydrates and the fat um, which is going to increase the energy level of the feed and you can increase the palatability you can add flavorings uh, you're going to decrease the dust like we talked about um, and other liquids they can add they can add micronutrients to it amino acids um, different types of flavoring or even um, mold inhibitors so preservatives to help keep the um, the feed fresh for longer so that was all about how do we process grain, right? We can have cold processing, hot processing, um, dry and wet methods of preparation. Um, so now let's talk about the dry forage and roughage processing. So how do we, um, how can we change some of these things to make it, to increase the digestibility or even palatability of some of these uh, hays? and roughages so a very common method especially for hay is baling um, and it's more labor intensive and you do get a moderate amount of waste right we talked a little bit before about that alfalfa where they kind of pick out the stems um, and only eat the leaves so you know you can get quite a bit of waste uh, with baling and you can have different size of bales so this would be a pretty large uh, round bale um, but you can make the smaller um, kind of rectangular shaped bales as well. Um, another thing that's becoming popular are these dehydrated bags of hay. So um, like here on the right, you see this tiny block of hay. So they essentially take out all the moisture. So they dehydrate the hay and it's easier to package it, a lot less waste. Um, and what happens is you reconstitute it. So you add it uh, into uh, you know, a bucket of water and it um, rehydrates itself. And it's, you know, they advertise that it's a way to increase um, the hydration of the animal because they're, you know, drinking more water, getting more water out of the, out of the hay. But um, I don't know necessarily comparing it one to one, the moisture level, I'm not quite sure, but it definitely would decrease the waste um, a little bit as well and easier to manage. So there's a few other ways that dry forage and roughage can be prepared. So you can also chop it or ground it up. And this is uh, definitely an advantage uh, for a more uniform product, meaning it's the same throughout. It reduces the waste. Um, the animals can't pick through it quite as well. It's not as good as pellets. Um, or anything like that, but it's definitely a little bit better so there is less feed refusal by the animals. And then something in interesting is they can uh, chemically treat some of these low digestible feeds, you know, these ones with high cellulose content, high lignin, um, essentially the straws, uh, you know, the cereal straws, the wood shavings, um, sugarcane, uh, bagasse, and so even some pineapple waste. So um, that sugarcane, when they make the sugar, uh, it's kind of the leftover pulpy um, straw 
uh, that's left over from that sugar cane. So um, all of these guys, you know, are very low um, in the digestible scale. So essentially they can increase that digestibility by treating it uh, with chemicals such as sodium hydroxide, urea, and essentially making them um, more digestible that they can feed, especially ruminants. Um, so it's a way to use these kind of byproducts that you know normally aren't used uh, as feed um, as feed. So uh, feed processing is also really important uh, when you're talking about those complete feeds out there. So a complete feed essentially means that you can feed it alone um, at, in the recommended dose to the animal um, and the animal will get all of its nutrients, required nutrients. So uh, these are complete feeds, fairly common um, in the animal production world, uh, but you really have to have at least um, some sort of uh, feed processing um, because you're mixing all these feeds together um, and creating this complete feed. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit, um, now that we know a little bit more about how feeds are processed, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about storage and sanitation. Uh, so when we talk about you know, these uh, commissaries or kitchens and who inspects them uh, for you know, cleanliness and all of that, um, we're talking about um, an, a corporation called uh, APHIS and it's under the USDA. So this APHIS Animal Care stands for Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. So it's a service under uh, the USDA that comes and um, inspects uh, these commissaries these kitchens um, for a couple of different things and we won't go through everything they inspect for uh, you guys may have another class on this um, in terms of what they look for maybe even have some experience with APHIS directly so they definitely look for cleanliness right counters sinks floors walls anything that's going to come in contact uh, with the food um, they're going to look at utensils, any other you know, can openers or devices that are going to come in contact, um, containers, you know, the cleanliness of the refrigerators and freezers, making sure everything's functioning uh, correctly and the correct type of disinfectants and cleaners are being used uh, in all these areas. So they're also looking for handling, right? So uh, how, how are the fresh fruits and vegetables handled, the fresh fish or meat, that there's no you know, cross-contamination between the meat and produce products. Um, also that there's appropriate thawing protocols for the frozen products so that they're thawed correctly, um, you know, looking for freezer burn. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, if any sort of live prey or insects are being used for food, that they are appropriately you know, contained and managed. Um, and that uh, any perishables, you know, there might be uh, a time lapse between when the food is prepared and when it's fed. So, you know, that there's refrigeration um, available for those perishables and things like that. So just that the handling is appropriate. Storage as well. So speaking of those perishables, uh, we want to have appropriate storage because what happens um, is food breaks down fairly quickly. And there's three major ways that food um, can break down. And the big one is oxidation. So that's our picture in the left, right? That's the browning of, um, you know, fruits, vegetables. Um, so it's an oxidative process just essentially by being in the air and exposed to oxygen. It's doing damage uh, to the, to the uh, plant or the fruit. Uh, desiccation or water loss, dehydration, essentially when the food you know loses water. So that's our picture on the right of the shriveled up apple. So you know a lot of things we want to dry out, and that's how we 
preserve them or keep them for longer, um, but some things we don't want uh, to become desiccated. And then leaching is another one. So we talked a little bit about leaching um, with our haze if, they're, if they sit out in the fields um, trying to dry and they get rained on. Um, the rain or the water uh, leaches out those nutrients uh, from the plant material. Uh, so that can also be a problem as well. So if, you, if stored correctly, hopefully the feed um, is not um, subject to these different uh, types of breakdown. So what do we care about for fresh foods, stored fresh fresh foods? Well, we definitely want to look at the use or best buy dates uh, for the food products. And there is a difference between some of these things because um, there's also sell by dates. So that's really for um, the company selling the product, not necessarily for when you should use it by. So if it's if it's a best before, you know, that's a recommended time, meaning it's up to your best judgment after that date. Um, but if it's a use by date, that's a fairly hard date. Um, it, you would be at risk uh, using it after that date. So these are perishables and they need to be kept in appropriate um, containers, uh, refrigerated if needed. Um, so these are our fresh food items. So we also want to uh, pay attention to our frozen food items and the appropriate storage. Uh, we want to make sure, uh, you know, we check the dates on the food because there's definitely a time limit for um, how long things should be pr frozen for. And you want to have some sort of rotation uh, of those frozen food products so nothing's left in there for too long. You also want to make sure, um, you know, it's stored correctly in the packaging because uh, if um, it's not and it's exposed to the air, you can get the freezer burn. Uh, so you want to evaluate everything for quality. There's a few things we want to look out for specifically with frozen fish and frozen meats. Um, with fish, vitamins can be lost um, in frozen and then thawed fish, specifically vitamin E and thiamine, one of our B vitamins. So we definitely want to pay attention to that. If an animal is, you know, maintain on a frozen fish diet, you need to consider, you know, supplementation of some of these vitamins that are lost in the freezing process. Um, for fish too, you definitely want to thaw it in the refrigerator and kept, keep it cold until it's fed. It can um, start decaying very quickly um, out in the open. Um, and for meat, um, you definitely want to use within 24 hours of thawing it. So once you take it um, out and it's thawed, um, and then if it's not eaten within 12 hours of feeding, uh, you should discard it. So it'll start um, deteriorating fairly rapidly after that. So some things you want to look out for, especially with these storage areas of um, frozen items, you just want to make sure that um, things are not thawed and then refrozen. Um, so that could be the whole freezer could be um, thawed and refrozen. So you want to check out the containers, um, the, the freezer, make sure there's no water or ice buildup around the containers or on the floor. Um, if the wrapping on the product is moist or slimy or discoloration of the wrapping, then you know something's happened. Um, or even the browning of the meat, um, some freezer burn, things like that. You just want to uh, make sure you evaluate those frozen items. So as far as dried food products go, you know, these are kept for a little longer periods of time versus our fresh foods. So, but the dates are still important and you um, still want to do rotation of the products um, because there is a date um, that they are good by. But the big thing for uh, dried foods are you just want to make sure that um, the packages um, and the containers are sealed uh, because you may need to reseal them if there's any damage to it. Um, and with the bulk 
you know, bulk products um, in the bigger bins. You just want to make sure, you know, there's no evidence of mold, um, uh, rodents or insects. You just want to make sure that um, the areas are clean of pests. As far as vitamin and mineral supplements go, um, it's really about the storage condition. So as long as um, they're kept in the right environment, um, that's what's important. Remember, a lot of our vitamins um, are light sensitive. So even just exposed to sunlight could be a problem. So making sure their container uh, is light proof um, making sure you abide by the expiration dates of the product. Um, so these are just things that we want to take into account uh, with vitamin and mineral supplements. For storage of hay and bulk grain, so these are kind of the big, you know, big bulky stuff that you need, either a hay barn, large area, probably maybe outside even. So definitely you want to pay attention to bird and rodent um, sources and pests. Um, you want to make sure that there's good ventilation in the barn um, so you get um, you don't get mold buildup as well um, any sort of toxic plants uh, that are either in the feeds um, or around the feeds and you want to make sure that the quality of the hay is good as well so you should have someone you know making sure when you get new shipments of hay and grain that the quality is there um, that it's species appropriate. Uh, so all these things that you're looking out for. And as far as the browse sources, so whether you're feeding browse as enrichment or around the enclosures, you just want to make sure um, there's no herbicides or insecticides or pesticides um, on those browse um, sources because that will be bad. So there's definitely other things to consider as well that we're not going to talk too much about in this lecture. Um, but like we said before, there should be somebody kind of um, doing quality control, uh, whether that's for the food vendor, the food supply, uh, making sure that uh, your shipments are good, uh, sampling the feed. You can definitely send in samples, especially of hay. Um, to make sure that you know the correct uh, mineral uh, levels are in the haze. Um, who approves the diet, right? So usually there's probably a vet on staff that is um, approving the diets. Um, any sort of enrichment um, items that are you know given to the animals, you want to make sure you know that they're species appropriate. Um, that uh, they're not getting too many enrichment items compared to their regular diet. So all these things are um, things to consider um, who is kind of in control of all of these things, making those decisions. So next week we have our second exam, um, uh, Wednesday, April 1st. And I know many of you guys have mentioned uh, that we need to have it a little bit later. Uh, so the window right now is gonna be from 11 to 12. So if you have a problem with that, you'll still be um, in the yard, let me know. Um, and we can adjust your time frame. Uh, but it's going to cover all these uh, chapters that we've been discussing, uh, vitamins and minerals, uh, some toxic plants, feeding preparation and storage and processing, um, all that good stuff. Um, so it's going to be uh, 30 questions instead of 60 questions, and it's going to be each question worth two points. Uh, so it'll cover um, the 60 point um, gap there. Um, and you'll have that hour to complete it. So it'll only be open for that hour on Canvas for you to complete. And it'll be the same um, as last time, kind of a combo of multiple choice, matching, true, false, 
um, very similar to the past exams. So make sure you study those as well. Um, but I'll also post a study guide uh, by the end of the week specifically, especially with those toxic plants since um, uh, we didn't cover those or you guys haven't covered those in the past uh, years. So let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, until next time, stay safe.